Good afternoon, everyone. Country Flyboy here, and I got a monkey wrench thrown at me. Thank you, Dovetail, for deciding to release the uh, SDK, not only as I was making this series, but as I got sick and couldn't make a video on it until now. I, I'm still a little bit, if you hear a difference in my voice. Anyway, Dovetail released the SDK for their flight sim, Flight Sim World, and... I thought it would be good to go over it as they made quite a few changes to it that I think will be useful. Now, I'm going to post a link to this video in the uh, forum on Steam, but but we're only going to go over the changes made in the Flight Sim World from FSX, at least as far as the CFG files go. Uh, if you want to know how to do everything else, my first suggestion is one, read the SDK. They've made it as easy as it's ever been by putting it online. So, you have no excuse now not to read it, developers. But also, watch the rest of the series. The rest of the series concerns FSX, but most of the stuff is the same. The stuff they've changed, we're going to talk about at least as much as we can. But uh, most of everything else is pretty much the same. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now, we're looking at the PA-46 Malibu as it appears in FSX. For those of you who don't know, Coronado made the PA-46 Malibu for FSX, and they made the one for Flight Sim World, though Dovetail has gone through and made some changes to it. This is the one in FSX, and the reason I loaded the FSX one in the AI Aircraft Editor is because AI Aircraft Editor has not been updated for Flight Sim World yet, and it doesn't recognize all the new parameters in the Weight and Balance section, so that's why it's uh, I loaded the FSX one, so you can clearly see what it looks like, particularly with the Weight and Balance stations which I have put in their correct places. They weren't there correctly by default. I had to edit them, but that's where they should be, basically. <clears throat> All right, so I'm not going to go over everything because most of this is straightforward. I'm going to go over the more detailed stuff that they did. Uh, the first section in their aircraft configurations bit, after the datum reference point and all that, is uh, everything that they've changed, added, or removed. Most of this stuff is um, either been removed or it's been edited slightly. Some of it's new, like the UI tile file, UI visible, stuff like that. That is all uh, new stuff. One note on UI visible, this goes in the flight sim in section of the CFG. This is a way of making particular paint jobs on the aircraft inaccessible through the UI. Uh, so you can have them for AI airplanes or you can have them for specific missions. They won't be accessible through the AI by turning this to uh, false. They'll still be accessible as AI airplanes or as a, a mission airplane if you design it that way, but they won't be selectable with the UI. Um, most of this has just been removed. The stuff I want to go over is the more interesting stuff, and we're going to start with the weight and balance section. So I've opened up the PA-46 Malibu on, uh, this is the FSX CFG file, and here we have the FSX folder, here we have the Flight Sim World folder. You can see mostly the same, only a few differences. So let's open up the CFG file for Flight Sim World. And here it is. As you can see, it's mostly the same kind of stuff. I'm going to scroll down to the Weight and Balance section because there is quite a few new things here. So Weight and Balance in FSX was pretty straightforward. You had weight, and then you had position data, and then you had the name. In Flight Sim World, they have done quite a fit bit more. All this up here, max gross weight, empty weight, reference datum, empty CFG, uh, MOI values, they're all the same. What's new is down here in the load strings. So they have several new numbers. The first number is either a one or a zero, and it designates whether the station is active or not. Now active does not mean it won't appear in the UI or anything like that. What this means is, is this station have weight in it by default? You're essentially uh, denoting whether this station is required or not. You're usually going to put a 1 for pilots. Okay, in the case of the PA-46 Malibu, it can be flown by one pilot, so <clears throat> you only need to put a 1 for station 0, which is the pilot seat. Technically, the co-pilot seat next to the pilot, you could put a one there if you want, but that's going to mean that it's a two-person plane. All right? So that one denotes whether or not it is a required station, essentially. Uh, 
<clears throat> that probably plays into the passengers feature of Flight Sim World, where uh, passengers actually appear in different weight and balance stations on the 3D model. So that's probably what that is. Uh, there was a quick edit feature in Flight Sim World where you can quickly just specify a number of passengers without worrying about particular weights. And that probably plays into that as well. The next number is the weight. And this is going to be the normal weight. Presumably if you use the quick edit feature for weight and balance, this is the weight it's going to use when you put someone in that station. All right, that's that really hasn't changed from the way it was in FSX. This next number is the maximum weight. Stations can now have a maximum weight associated with them where this, the UI and the sim will not let you go over that. So we have 350 pounds for each seat in the airplane. These are the seats right here. And then the cargo bays, 100 pounds each. It seems a bit light, but I don't have a POH for the Malibu, so I'll assume that's right. I'll assume they did their research. The next three numbers, two point, these here, these are the longitude and the lateral and vertical positions relative to the datum, just like they were in FSX. This last number is passenger index. Now this I need to explain a bit. The passenger index is a way of classifying a payload station. And uh, you put a negative one for not a person, for not a person, i.e. a baggage bay. So you can see we have a minus one for stations six and seven because they are the forward and aft baggage sections. We have zero up here for station zero. What is a zero? A zero is a pilot. So anything, the pilot and co-pilot, you would put a zero. In this case, PA-46 Malibu, again, can be flown by a single pilot, so you only have to specify which seat the pilot is in. You could call the second seat the co-pilot seat if you wish, but it's not required. It could be a forward passenger as well. And you can see that here. The next numbers, one, two, three, etc. so you can go up from one. If it's not a negative zero or not a zero, then it's gonna be a passenger, which is one, two, three, and so on. So zero is pilot, negative one is baggage, and any positive number is a passenger. And it's going up in order of passenger seats there. So that is basically the weight and balance section. There's a few other sections that saw some uh, changes and a few new sections. So we have other reference as well as UI strings here. You can read these in the SDK. They're really simple, not even worth going over. Uh, I will say with these, they do specify that these are all supposed to be short, so please keep it short. The only one I think that's worth going over is the crew passenger, which seems to be a ratio or like a, uh, a string for the amount of crew and passengers the aircraft can have. E.g. a 1 plus 3 or a 2 plus 2 is 1 crew, 3 passengers, 2 crew, 2 passengers, respectively. So the example they give is on the DA-42 Diamond Star, the twin Diamond Star, and it's a one point, it's a one plus one. Other reference, this is just other reference data, pretty straightforward. All right, the next thing we want to talk about is a section in the CFG file that's new to Flight Sim World, and it's called AccuFeel. For those of you not in the know, AccuFeel was an add-on in FSX. It cost like 30 bucks or something like that. Really good add-on. It's one of my top recommended add-ons. In fact, I think it was like the second best add-on ever in that video I made that we shall not discuss. But it was an add-on in FSX that comes with Flight Sim World. It's default in Flight Sim World. And the section of the CFG file lets you specify it. In Flight, in Flight Sim X, you had a UI to uh, specify all this stuff. Nice pretty sliders and all that. In Flight Sim World, you have to do it through the aircraft CFG file. So I think it's going to be beneficial especially considering Dovetail doesn't explain all this too much in the, in the SDK. So I'll go over it real quick. AccuFeel on or off. So AccuFeel on off, either going to be a 1 or a 0, and it's just a flag. 0 turns AccuFeel off, 1 turns it on. Probably going to want to put this for 1 on basically all airplanes. Master Volume. Now Master Volume, I believe, was a global value in AccuFeel. Uh, for FSX, in Flight Sim World, all of this seems to be specific to the aircraft. N some of them are not global anymore. Uh, all this stuff up here was global in FSX, meaning it affected all aircraft. 
But in Flatsome World, although they are repeated, they seem to be specific to the airplane. Master Volume is a scalar. It was not a scalar, it's a slider, so it's going to be a 0 to 100 value. 0 turns it off, it completely mutes the volume, and 100 is maximum volume. So this is basically master volume of all the sound effects from AccuFeel. Global Turbulence, Strength, and Volume. I have the AccuFeel manual here. So Global Turbulence adjusts the turbulence effect all the way to the left, or full 0 will disable all turbulence, and all the way to the right increases the turbulence strength to maximum. So the higher you put this is this number, the more the stronger the turbulence is going to be. Basically, zero turns it off. One hundred is full strength. You probably want to put this somewhere around fifty. Uh, this changes depending on airplanes. Bigger airplanes like jets, seven thirty seven for example, they are less affected by turbulence than smaller airplanes. Uh, see weather when it comes to turbulence, pyreps. They always specify the aircraft type because that's important to know. Um, like moderate turbulence in a 737 would be severe turbulence for a Cessna 172. So keep that in mind when you're adjusting these two values. Now global turbulence volume I don't actually see on here. So I'm not sure what that is. That might be... I have no clue. Do they say? No, they do not. Hmm. Interesting. I'm not quite sure what that one is. Moving on. Open cockpit. This is a flag. Zero is, for most airplanes, going to be a closed cockpit, so most of the time this is going to be zero. But for airplanes with an open cockpit, i.e. a Boeing Stearman, one. This specifies that the cockpit is open. Why is that important? A lot of these sounds will play or get louder when a door is open. So when a door is open, a lot of these planes, a lot of these settings will get extremely loud. Uh, which is exactly what you want. You want them to be loud. Your door is open. It's not a quiet environment. However, if it's an open cockpit, they should be at full blast all the time, right? So that specifies that. Now, aircraft volume. In Flight Sim X, this is how you adjusted the master volume of a particular aircraft, whereas this one was global. This one was a particular aircraft. Kind of redundant in Flight Sim World, so set it to the same as master volume, I guess. I'm I don't know if there's a difference between them in Flight Sim World. They probably is. Maybe it's just a boost. Maybe you could think of it as a, a volume booster or something. Stall AOA. Now, stall AOA is stall angle of attack. I need to uh, specify something here. There is a difference between stall AOA and pitch. All right, An airplane can stall at any pitch and any airspeed. Although pitch is related to it, and here's how. I brought up Wikipedia article on angle of attack. Now here they have a, a Predator drone, but it can work. You can see the Predator's drone's wings are basically aligned along its axis here. This red horizontal axis is the wing cord that runs from the tip of the leading edge to the tip of the trailing edge. That's the cord line. Relative wind is the way the wind is hitting the wing. Uh, this both of both of these changes obviously the the cord angle the cord line will pitch up and down with the aircraft's pitch relative wind changes depending on how the air is hitting the airplane this has nothing to do with uh wind as you know it in weather this is how the air is hitting the uh wing that's relative wind both of these can change the pilot has control of angle of, of the pitch angle it has relative control over the relative wind. Now, angle of attack is the pitch angle, or the difference between pitch angle and relative wind angle. You see that little there? That's the angle between the two. That's angle of attack. That's what you specify here. This is the angle of attack that is critical, or the critical angle of attack. An airplane can stall at any pitch or airspeed, but will always stall at the same angle of attack. That's the critical angle of attack and that's what you put here. Now stall instability. Some airplanes are more stable in a stall than others. 172 is a pretty stable airplane and it is pretty stable in a stall. It's actually pretty hard to spin. So this basically is a slider 0 to 100. The higher the value the more unstable the airplane is going to be in a stall which if the physics are modeled very well 
would probably mean that it's going to be more likely to spin when you stall it. So spins bad, stalls bad too, but we kind of have to learn how to do them in flight training, but you don't have to learn how to do spins. Now max mock, max indicated airspeed. These are two airspeed values and they're both the same. They are the VNE or V never exceed of the airplane. One is the indicated 1. or 198 in this aircraft and the other is the Mach number. Now, a few of these down here, these are getting into uh, volumes here. We have wind volume, prop volume, and drag rumble volume here. Now, these are sliders, 0 to 100. Again, higher number, the more higher the volume is. Wind is the wind rushing past the cockpit as the plane moves through the air. Uh, this is going to get louder. All three of these will, or these two will get louder when a door is open. This one, not so much, but wind and prop get definitely louder when a uh, door is open. You're specifying their maximum volume. They get muffled when a door is closed. That's by their very nature. But when a door is open, these get considerably louder. They go up to the max volume you specify here. So again, wind is the air rushing past the cockpit as the plane moves forward through the air, not the sound of wind. Well, it's relative to airspeed, so wind is gonna wind weather wind is gonna affect that too. But this is more value of wind going past the cockpit, not weather. Prop volume is you can hear the prop. You can hear the prop spinning uh, when a door is open. Well, you can you can kind of when a door is closed, but you can definitely hear it spinning when a door is open. And this is the volume of the prop spinner, basically. Drag rumble. Uh, this comes more into play with airplanes that have retractable gear. But what this is, when you lower that landing gear down into the uh, into the airflow. It's basically a rigid, flat, essentially, structure that is interrupting an otherwise smooth flow. It has a noticeable effect on the aircraft's flight dynamics in the form of a lot of parasitic drag, and it also has its own sound. You will hear the wind hitting that thing, and it creates a bit of a rumbling sound. Uh, this is probably going to be lower value for fixed gear airplanes like the PA or not or like a 172 but for retractable gear airplanes you probably want this to be pretty high keep in mind where the cockpit is with all of these things because <clears throat> these most of these play or pretty much all of them play from within the cockpit so keep in mind where the cockpit is relative to the things on the airframe that causes this this is chiefly caused by landing gear but can also be caused by spoilers and flaps as well so keep in mind where those are relative to the cockpit. So on smaller planes that have retractable gear, like the PA-46, you probably want this to be relatively high, uh, around 50, maybe above 50. They use 35 here for whatever reason. But on bigger airplanes that have these surfaces, they're further back, uh, like a 737, they're further back. You have the nose gear directly underneath you, though. So keep all that in mind when you're deciding on these volumes and Always remember, you can come in and change them. Now, chop and gust. Chop and gust are turbulence values. Chop is up and down movement. Uh, up and down as the aircraft cuts through uh, choppy air. And turbulence, uh, wind gust, is the wind... Gust is the wind gust, which is responsible for knocking the aircraft around. And here, you're basically setting intensity sliders, like how... How intense is these two turbulence values for this particular aircraft? Again, chop is up and down movement. Gust is kind of up and down movement too, but more left and right lateral movement. And they are strength sliders, 0 to 100. And you're adjusting strength there. There is also a, a, a sound associated with it, but uh, that's more of a strength slider. Clear air turbulence. Now this is one thing that is a bit tricksy. Clear air turbulence is the term used for unexpected pockets of turbulence in otherwise calm conditions. Uh, for those of you who don't know weather all that well, turbulence is a factor of convective action, which is uh, vertically rising air. If wind is horizontal movement of air, then convection is vertical movement of air. Most turbulence comes from convective action. Uh, wind can cause turbulence too, but most turbulence we deal with is convective. 
So clear air turbulence is turbulence that happens in what we would think is otherwise stable air. And here, I think this is in a strength slider. What is this? Now this is actually a, uh, a chance slider. So zero to 100 again, but if you set it to 50, a value of 50 means on average you will encounter clear air turbulence every four hours of flight. So you're setting a chance here. 50 is one instance of clear air turbulence every four hours. I guess 100 would be one instance every hour or so. Not 100% sure, but uh, that is a strength slider. Now, these three play into the weather, at least in FSX, it depended on how the weather actually was. Because this would enhance whatever turbulence or weather effects were acting on the airplane by the weather engine. Now in Flight Sim World, they used a different weather engine. They completely gutted the old FSX weather engine and used True Sky as their weather engine. So I don't know if this is any different. I will assume it's not, but keep that in mind. Weather engine is different. This depends on existing conditions. So if you use a weather theme and specify that all the weather is calm, completely calm, there's not going to be any wind, there's not going to be any convective action, these won't freaking matter. Now, these next few going down to here, these are all strength scalers, 0 to 100, higher the number, the more intense. They also have volumes associated, they also have sounds associated with them, but you're not adjusting a volume here, we're adjusting a strength. So first one is cabin integrity. This controls how tight or loose a cabin is. Tight or loose, newer airplanes that are fresh off the line, more modern airplanes should have a higher number to a point. If you're making a jet like a 737, this should be somewhat low as well, lower than you might think it is because a, uh, a 737, big airplane, it's gonna have quite a bit of rattle in it even though it's a brand new, maybe fresh off the line 737. Now basically, this is um, controlling how old the aircraft sounds. When you uh, hit a bump or you land hard or something like that, you hear parts of the airframe creak, uh, clang, clatter, whatever. Older airplanes will do this more than newer airplanes. Bigger airplanes will do this more than smaller airplanes. So that's how you're, con you're controlling that there. It's a percent slider, strength slider, zero to 100, you get it. Shock absorption, this controls how good the aircraft is at absorbing small impacts. What I mean by small is as the aircraft rolls across the ground at a slow speed, not takeoff or landing speed, this is more for taxiing. Uh, this is taxiing across a smooth surface, a rough surface, a crashable surface. How well does it absorb uh, smaller impacts from holes or bumps, pebbles, whatever? How well does it absorb them? Fixed gear airplanes like a 172 probably want a lower value. Retractable gear airplanes, higher value. Retractable gear with good shock absorption, definitely a higher value. Brake squeal. This is, this is basically adjusting. This kind of is a volume in a way. You're adjusting... Um, brake squeal as you apply the brakes. Um, the pad hits the rotor and it squeals. You know, it does. And you're adjusting how intense and how loud the squeal is here. Tire screech. When the airplane lands, the tire is moving very slowly. It might not be moving at all or it might be moving very, very slow. But the second it hits the pavement, it goes from moving slowly to moving very quickly and it will skid. It will leave rubber on the pavement and it will make a sound, a erk sound. You are controlling just how loud and intense that erk sound is, that screech sound. Keep in mind, this will scale with how hard your landing is. So keep that in mind. Harder landings cause a greater effect here. Now tire side forces. This controls sort of the side force sound of tires as they kind of move across the ground. Uh, tires like to roll forward and roll back. They don't like to turn. And when you turn them, you're, you are applying some amount of side force to them, particularly on fixed gear airplanes, like say a 172. The nose gear turns so that it's 
axis of rotation is always aligned with its movement direction. But the main gear doesn't turn and kind of slides. So they're going to have some side force on them. Now, for those of you who've never flown a 172 before, they don't like side forces, particularly on landing. Uh, if you land with any amount of crab, they really don't like it. And you're adjusting that here. Uh, side forces is the direction of movement, axis of rotation, not aligned with the direction of movement of the tire, basically. And you're adjusting how intense the uh, sounds associated with side force are here. Essentially, it is a volume. Now, these next, these next four concern only float planes, which at time of recording, there are no float planes in Flight Sim World. Though, according to a, a Twitter post by Dovetail, they are working on float planes. Anyway, these apply to float planes and float planes only. Water drag. So, <clears throat> water drag, basically this increases the drag value of water. Now, those of you who don't know too much about float planes, on a land-based airplane, the, the ground friction only acts on one part of the plane, and that's the tire, where the tire meets the pavement. That is the one and only part of the airframe that ground drag acts on. However, on float planes, water drag acts on the entire surface area of the float that is in the water. So float planes have a lot more ground drag essentially to deal with, which is why they have significantly longer takeoff runs than their land-based counterparts. The, the drag of the water acts on the entire float. And you're basically adjusting the strength of the water drag here. Now, float planes have special procedures for taking off that make them somewhat different from land planes. And one of the procedures is overcoming just how strong water drag can be. So, I don't really know. I don't have any recommendations what to put here. Play around with it. It's a strength cider, 0 to 100. 50 is pretty normal most of the time. But play around with it to see what values feel right for the airplane. Now, auto waves. This is going to take a bit of explaining. Auto waves is a flag. Zero is off. One is on. You're probably going to want to turn this on for most things. And when you turn this on, automatic wave logic takes over. Now, in real life, waves are up and down movement of water. They're not actually moving the water, and the waves themselves aren't actually moving. They're just an up and down movement. You can think of them that way. They do kind of actually move with wind, but for the sake of the argument, waves are nothing more than up and down movement of water. They are caused by wind, chiefly. There are other factors that can cause them, underground earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, stuff like that, but most of the time, the wind is the core thing that decides waves. It, it determines wave height, wave period, everything. So, AccuFeel tries to recreate that by looking at what the surface wind condition is when the plane's on the water and uses that to change how frequently and intensely the plane bobs up and down in the water. Now, Flight Sim World, by extension FSX and, and seemingly X-Plane 2, they all use a 2D wave texture so the water is actually completely 2D. Since most of the time you're going to be seeing it from above anyway, this isn't that big a deal. It definitely is ugly when you get down on the ground. But uh, since you spend most of your time up in the air, it's not that big a deal that it's a 2D wave texture. So that means that the waves have to be sort of procedurally generated by some sort of logic here. They're not going to line up with the waves you see in the sim. Uh if you turn this off, these two values come into effect here. So if you set this to zero, you then have to worry about these two. If it's a one, you can set these if you want, but they're not going to come into play. Because these two are automatically adjusted based on the wind speed when automatic wave logic is turned on. If you turn it off, then wave size, which I don't think is any in any particular measurement, 
Uh, it seems to be a strength slider, 0 to 100, but uh, uh, wave size becomes a factor when this is uh, turned off. Wave size being how big the wave is. And wave speed is not technically the wave period. How, how often do you encounter a wave is wave speed. Again, I recommend using auto waves here because it makes it a lot more... Um, a lot more realistic and a lot more fun because float planes have to worry about the wind even more than land-based airplanes because the wind controls the surface conditions of the water as well as being well just important for airplanes in general now there's one last thing i want to talk about i'm not going to go too into detail on it because uh i'm not 100 percent versed with this myself but there's one last thing i think we should talk about so we need to talk about the model CFG file. Let me open both of them up because I want to show you the big difference. This is the model CFG file the way it was in FSX. As you can see, we just have the normal, which is the exterior model, and we have the interior, which is obviously the interior model. This is the same aircraft in Flight Sim World. So you can see we have our normal and interiors, but we have all this as well. Now this plays into the passenger system of Flight Sim World. Those of you who haven't played Flight Sim World, if you're watching this, I don't know why, but if you're if if you remember, Flight Sim World has a passengers feature. What this is is passengers will visibly appear and disappear depending on the weight and balance data. More if you put weight in a particular payload station, then a passenger appears there if it's a seat. This also comes into play with uh, how much weight you put there. Uh, higher values lead to a male passenger. Lower values seem to be female. At least when I tested it, that seemed to be the case. Maybe I, maybe it's not, and I just got lucky, but that seemed to be the case. And, of course, really low values, I assume, would be a box or a baggage or something like that. But those passengers are a 3D model. Now, I, I want to point something out. This was actually not 100% a new feature because there is an airplane I have in FSX. It's a freeware um, Harrier jet that you can get on Riku, I believe, and it somewhat did this. Uh, when you put, it had a complex weight and balance section where if you put weight in certain sections, so you put 500 pounds in station four, aim nines would appear on the wingtips, and you could completely change the weapon configuration of the plane simply by changing the weight and balance data, which was a really neat thing. Now, these 3D models, Vison World seems to have brought this uh, feature to the forefront, and they have made some changes to it. Uh, notably, these 3D models, in order for a 3D model to be usable, it has to be called upon, it has to be stored somewhere. Here is where you specify the file locations of the 3D models. So, if we go to Flight Sim World's uh, folder here, it specifies pilot, and it has three values, base, body, and head, pilot, and it says the file location of the base is in characters, animations, anim, pilot, PA46, MDL. Let's go there. Now I can tell you that's in sim objects. Here's characters, animations, anim, pilot, PA46, MDL. And you see there's um, meshes here as well. And we also specify for passengers. Now, this is not the only thing needed to get the pilot's features working. Obviously, accurate weight and balance data is required as well with the rest of the CFG file. And there's probably some part of the 3D modeling that needs to be done a certain way too. But here we are basically just specifying the file locations, render parameter, and passenger number. So... Normal and interior hasn't changed from FSX. Pilot, base, body, and head. The location of the pilot animation relative to the model CFG file, usually the file will be named anim pilot aircraft name dot MDL. You can read this. I'm not going to go over all of it. The one thing I am going to go over is capacity. This is the number of passengers that the aircraft can have, not including the pilot. So I assume this does not include the pilot or required flight or cabin crew of, a of an airplane. 
only the passenger count. Capacity equals five in their example. In our PA46, capacity is five. It can hold five passengers. And if we look at it, we can see there are one, two, three, four seats in the back, plus this one up front, five passengers. And it looks like everything else is named according to what that seat is. So co-pilot seat, this one, and this is the um, information for it. Read the SDK. I'm not 100% versed on this, but I wanted to go over it here because it is a pretty neat feature. And uh, it's something to know, especially because I think now that the SDK is out, a lot of people are going to try to be bringing FSX airplanes over to Flight Sim World. This is definitely something I would consider required because that was such a cool feature of Flight Sim World. Technically, it was a feature of FSX, but they brought it to the forefront because the FSX SDK never mentioned that. Now, there is one last thing I want to go over. I'm going to need to bring up another aircraft CFG file to do it, though. Okay, here I've brought up a CFG file from an FSX aircraft, uh, a Freeware F-18C, not the default F-18. And the reason I didn't bring up the default is because I want to show you this line right here. Note that the fuel tank name is external. I should have went over this in fuel, but I forgot to. And I think I, I definitely need to specify it here. Not too many developers ever made use of this feature, but external fuel tanks have a special feature in Flight Sim X that I'm assuming will work in Flight Sim World 2. External tanks are droppable. So you could have two external tanks simply by changing external one to external two, just like that. So external one and external two. Two external tanks and uh, specifying their positions. External tanks are droppable by a key command. You can drop one or the other. The key command has to be hit twice per tank. I believe the key command I use is shift left bracket for the external one and shift right bracket for external two. It has to be hit twice because the first time you hit it arms it and the second time you hit it actually jettisons it. Now this is different from fuel dumping because note that the external tanks hold 330 gallons of fuel on this airplane. So if I burn 200 of that, I have 130 gallons left. If I jettison them at 130 gallons, I lose that 130 gallons. That's different from the dump system. The dump system dumps a certain amount of fuel per second, whereas this jettisons any remaining fuel in that tank because you just knock the tank off of your airplane. Now, remember the passenger features I talked about, it being in FSX but not really documented? Uh, in FSX, you can actually tie a 3D model to a weight and balance section, but not to a fuel fuel section. So Dovetail, if you're listening, please add some visual external tanks and make it so we can tie parts of a 3D model to the fuel station because external tanks are droppable. Maybe add a third external tank too if I'm, if I'm going to be requesting features here, but you can have a maximum of two external tanks, and with the use of key commands or gauges, if the aircraft supports it, you can actually jettison those fuel tanks. So that's a good thing to know there. And with that, I think we're pretty much done. That, that's pretty much gone over everything there is to go over. That's worth going over. Obviously, there is a lot of, well, quite a bit of new stuff in Flight Sim World CFG files, but that was the meat and potatoes of it. Everything else you can pretty much read. It's pretty straightforward, but that was the stuff I thought might be somewhat confusing to people. So hope you enjoyed it and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone.